Uh, great, yeah. So thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to speak in this group. Uh, the talk so far has been really great and interesting. I'm, I'm uh, happy to share this stuff with you all. Um, so I, I just like starting with acknowledgements. And um, a lot of this stuff has been done with Alex McGillner, uh, who many of you probably know. Um, he's been thinking about the mitotic spindle for like 25 years now and has incredible insight towards it. Uh, but the the real acknowledgement that I want to provide here are the brilliant biologists that I work with, that uh, these projects have really given me like a newfound appreciation for how hard biology is and the extremely difficult images that they obtain. And I, I hope that you'll appreciate some of them because they, they totally blow my mind what they're able to do. And uh, that's the lab of Alexei, Alexei Kojikov with the New York State Department of Health and his postdoc, Fiori. Um, so I, I'm going to talk about a, a few things today that I, I, this outline makes it seem like maybe they're more disjoint than they are, but I, I think there's sort of a natural flow to these. And um, I was just overhearing that the audience is quite diverse in the background. So I just want to start with a reminder about what mitosis even is. And that, that's going to be kind of the main theme of the talk is modeling various aspects of mitosis. And then I'm going to talk about one project that's kind of more classical math bio modeling, like we're trying to capture some qualitative features that we see. And then the second project is, is what I sort of think of as a more modern thing where we have actual data. and We're trying to think about like, what do we do with actual data in the, the modeling realm? So mitosis, maybe the last time you, you thought about this word was in grade school and you had to memorize all the different phases like anaphase and prometaphase or something like that. But um, this movie I think is, is probably the reminder that you needed about it. So um, this movie is, is an actual cell undergoing cell division. And that's what mitosis is. So the key part about cell division is that um, copies of DNA are made. So if I, if I pause the video at the beginning, and I hope that it's playing, uh, if I pause the video at the beginning, the DNA has already been copied, and that's the stuff in red. And it's scattered about kind of randomly throughout the cell after it's been copied. And the goal is basically that each new cell after division gets one strand of each DNA, basically. So Everything's scattered about. And then if I sort of slide through the video, you see some stuff is starting to get organized. And then right about here, here's the important thing is the DNA ends up in the middle of this thing that I'm calling the mitotic spindle. So you see now all the red stuff is kind of in the middle of this kind of football shaped, uh, well, I guess there's a lot of Europeans, American football shaped uh, object. And uh, what happens a little bit later in the video, okay, the stuff in the middle is there. It's kind of wiggling around. And now here the division happens. And each new cell then rips apart the strands and gets their proper copy. And now two new cells are formed and each new cell has all of the DNA that it wants. So the, the key thing about this is basically the spatial organization of DNA so that when the cell divides, each one gets its, its proper copy. So th this process is what I'll talk about throughout the talk which is spatially moving around DNA, basically putting things in the right place so that cell division happens properly. Uh, this video is beautiful, but it's kind of hard to tell what's going on under the hood. So I, I think about biology in terms of cartoons and I, I like to draw this cartoon and this is a little bit jargony, but I, you don't really have to remember the, the technical words here so much as the components. So um, the DNA are the things that are getting moved around and those are called chromosomes, but I'll, I'll probably call them DNA throughout the talk. And the main way that they're manipulated is they have these handles, basically these attachment sites that they, they get grabbed onto. And those attachment sites are called kinetochores, but you can just think about them as handles where something grabs onto them and then pulls them around. And what is it that's pulling them around? Well, here's kind of the, the puppet masters of the whole process. There's these filaments in a cell called microtubules. And these filaments are these richly stochastic basically long fingers that are stochastically growing and shrinking at all times. And the poles, these things called centrosomes, the thing I'm drawing in the, in the blue, are kind of like the centers. They're like the asters of these fingers. So microtubules grow and shrink stochastically out of these poles. And these poles are basically the, the organization centers for these fingers. And the fingers are the main manipulators of everything. They kind of steer everything around and they control the whole process. They're really kind of the, the backbone of this whole device. And I, I think 
you can hopefully see this movie that they really are stochastically growing and shrinking. So this is like actually in a cell. You can see it's it's kind of growing and shrinking sometimes at its tip. Um, okay, so there's the poles, there's the microtubules, and there's one last component. Um, stuff is moving around. Physics tells us how to move stuff around. You have to generate forces. And the, the sort of last ingredient in this is there's these tiny little proteins called molecular motor proteins. And they're, they're really, really fascinating. And I, I could talk forever about them. But basically what you can think about them as these little cars, basically, that want to rev their engines and walk along the microtubule filaments. But in doing so, they basically generate forces. So you could think about it that there's some proteins floating around that attach to stuff that generate forces so things can move. So microtubules are kind of like the architecture, and then these are the things that generate forces in the process. And uh, biology is really messy and annoying. Um, so I, the thing I'm trying to convey with this cartoon where you see a bunch of different vehicles is that actually in mitosis, there's something crazy like 18 different molecular motors that go into the process. And there's kind of, they're different in their details, but conceptually, at least for this talk, all you need to know is there's little proteins that basically exert forces. They pull on stuff. And yeah, so, so what I'm trying to convey with the different vehicle types is that the details are a little bit different and a few different ones go into this, but they essentially do the same thing. They, they effectively all pull. So what is mitosis then, or at least the step that I wanna talk about today? So. You put all of this ingredients in a cell, you put the poles with the microtubules growing and shrinking out of them, you have the DNA scattered about and these motor proteins uh, floating around and you get organization out of this. So this is a machine that the cell does. So it, the, the cell uses these components and what does it do? It, it manages to manipulate the DNA to the middle of the two poles and basically exert forces on each side of the DNA to rip it apart. So it rips each side of the DNA into a new cell. So this whole process is the fascinating biological process of mitosis. I mean, there's, there's some other parts before and after this, but this is the thing that I think is, is the sort of fascinating thing. And uh, it's to me, one of the more complicated stories in biology. Like I've tried to simplify it as much as possible, but uh, even this uh, slide, I think there's a lot going on. But uh, to me, that's kind of what makes it exciting is there's this really complex system and we sort of have measurements of each of the components, but how they combine to produce this wildly complex task is, is really quite mysterious. And that, that's kind of the overarching theme of a lot of this. And I, oh, I, I guess I just want to emphasize that the goal is sort of to end up in the middle of the poles and get ripped apart, which I already said. So I hope that that made some sense. I know there's a lot of jargon, but I'll try and remind you about like what each of the words means. But essentially you can think about mitosis as trying to take the DNA and put it in the middle of the poles. And that, that's kind of the, the most important part for this talk. Um, and, and using kind of dumb ingredients. So none of the ingredients really know that that's the goal. You just kind of put them together and somehow that's what they end up with. That's, that's kind of the important organization part. Um, I do just want to acknowledge that there is a ton of math modeling in this realm. And uh, it's sort of a really rich history. So this, this paper from Holy and Liebler is one of my favorite classical math bio papers. And uh, at least as far as mathematical biology, the, the idea that people really latched onto early was this idea of stochastically searching for the DNA using these fingers. And I, I think this paper is totally worth checking out. It, it even holds up today that Basically, there's this, this idea of search and capture where you stochastically grow and shrink these fingers, and then you can compute, like given the stochastic search process, what is basically the expected time to find each side of the DNA? And th this paper is beautiful, the math is really cool, and it basically argues that, yeah, like you can really find the DNA in a reasonable amount of time doing this. If you're just stochastically growing and shrinking fingers, you'll eventually hit those attachment sites. And this idea is called search and capture. But uh, I would say since this paper was published in almost 30 years ago now, um, people have kind of pointed out that, yeah, this idea is really beautiful mathematically and it makes some sense, but there's kind of some fundamental issues with this. And one of which is that you're not trying to find just one DNA particle, you're trying to find basically 46 of them simultaneously. So when you now think about this as a task of looking for 46 things, you could talk about the distribution of times. 
And what you get basically out of this stochastic search process is something that's roughly exponentially distributed. So you find some of them really fast, but then the bad ones, you, you kind of take a decent amount of time to find. But we know from experimental measurements that this really isn't how mitosis occurs, that roughly all of them are found at the same time, like Gaussian-like is what I'm trying to draw with this cartoon. So this is a little bit weird. And the other thing is that when you're stochastically searching, you want each side to basically get attached to by each of the poles. So that like the cartoon that I drew in the top right, that's the, that's the perfect scenario. Each side of the DNA is associated with each pole and that way it can get ripped apart and go to its new cell. But there's nothing preventing errors in this stochastic search model where both sides of the DNA are attached to the same pole. And this is a real phenomenon that happens in biology, but with this sort of naive stochastic search process, uh, you get enormous amounts of errors. And we know that, I mean, your cells make some errors, but they don't make nearly as many errors as the model would predict if, with this naive stochastic search. So I, I just sort of wanted to summarize, like what are the big questions in the field? And I think those are two of them. And a lot of papers have come out in the last 30 years trying to add some details to the search process. Maybe there's some geometric effects. Maybe there's some bias in the search of these fingers. But fundamentally, like I would say search and capture is a nice idea that's still kind of dubious as far as the data is concerned. And I, I'm not gonna address either of these questions today, but I like to give people like an idea of what are the big questions in the field. And I would say th this is the big question is like, Yes, there's clearly some stochastic search happening, but like, how does it manage to do it so quickly and efficiently? That's kind of like the big question of, of mitosis. Um, I kind of want to talk about a, a slightly different story related to mitosis. And to me, this is almost an easier question that we can make progress on. And the nice thing about biology is that, yeah, I mean, it's, it's nice to study when biology works, like when, it, when everything goes properly. It, it's nice to understand that. But it's often revealing in biology when something goes wrong because the way it goes wrong is, is somehow informative. And that, that's kind of the flavor of this question of this first project that I wanna talk about. So it's, it's mitosis going wrong tells us something about how it works. So here's a little more background. So um, cancer cells are defective. I mean, that's what makes them cancer cells. They're, they're mutated. And the way that some cancer cells are mutated is that they have extra centrosomes. So those things that the fingers emanate from. So the fingers grow out of these things and cancer cells pretty often have more than two. And what I'm showing you is a picture on the left of a mitotic spindle. So this is a cell undergoing mitosis. That's a cancer cell. And you can see this looks quite different, right? It's not this classic bipolar structure where there's two sides to it. There's three sides to it. And that's because this cancer cell was defective and had an extra one at the start. And your cells are smart. They can detect when things go wrong. They can say, well, that's not regular mitosis. Like I'm going to die. Like I, I should self-destruct. This is bad. This is suspicious. I'm, I'm going to die like that. That's good. I mean, that's what you want your cells to do. If something goes wrong, they basically exit and say, no, I'm not going to propagate this, this weird mutation. But cancer cells are also very tricky. So uh, what I'm showing you in this sequence of images is, uh, so time goes from left to right here. So on the leftmost image is a cell, a cancer cell starting cell division. And each of the yellow dots is a centrosome. So it's, it's one of these organizing centers for the, the, the microtubules. And you can see at the left, it has what, six of them? So six is a lot more than two. That's, that seems bad. But what is the cancer cell able to do? Well, if you look in the progression of time, what it does is it actually sort of clusters these two things and it looks like if I just showed you the image on the far right, you would tell me that's a perfectly good mitotic spindle. That's exactly what it looks like in the textbook, right? It's this bipolar structure that's kind of this like ovally shape. And in fact, your cell doesn't detect this as an error and the cell wins. So this is a mechanism by which cells, or cancer cells basically fake being healthy cells is they basically circumvent this test for did mitosis happen properly? And they can basically form bipolar spindles. So bipolar meaning there's two um, in, in spite of starting with many. So to me, this is ripe for mathematical modeling. We, we have a qualitative thing that we're trying to understand. If you start with a bunch of uh, centrosomes, if you start with a bunch of these organizing centers, why can you get different shapes out of them? It's a very qualitative thing. We're talking about shapes that you end up with here. So I, I think this is a, a pretty natural thing to try and model. 
So um, Alex and I saw this and we said, okay, well, can we write down a model that, that basically results in these, these particular shapes? And we don't know super, I mean, we, we know stuff about what should go into the model, but it was really just saying, can we write down a model that captures these behaviors in some, some ways? So um, let me tell you a bit about the model that we, we came up with. Um, so we're thinking about viscous motion. So we're trying to describe how stuff moves around. So moving around forces. So what we're thinking about, the centrosomes, the, the things that are, I, I guess I keep calling them poles, but we're, we're, yeah, you can think of them as poles, basically. So the poles we think of are just dots. They're just particles. And we're doing this in two dimensions because a lot of our images are in two dimensions. So the centrosomes are, are just dots. I'll call those Y, I, and there's, there's some number of them, maybe six. Um, and then the chromosomes, the DNA. Well, those are also things that have a spatial position, which I'll call XJ. But what we thought is important is that they're actually these really big objects. I mean, you could tell this from the first movie, I think. They're these really big, long objects that we think the orientation of matters. So because we're just in 2D for this model, I only need to keep track of one particular angle and I'll call that angle, well, one angle for each chromosome and I'll call that angle phi, uh, theta J. Okay, so then what, what causes the positions and angles to move? Well, if we assume that the motion is viscous, then velocity is for, uh, proportional to force. And that's basically what the, the model is, is we say, okay, well, the centrosomes move based on the forces exerted on them. The chromosomes move based on the forces and the angle changes based on torque. And this is pretty common modeling assumption is that we assume that everything in this system interacts pairwise. So each of the centrosomes inter interacts with other centrosomes. So uh, poles interact with poles and poles also interact with DNA. So I'm not really saying exactly what the interaction is just yet, but I'm just telling you that we put a bunch of green dots down and we put a bunch of blue lines down and then everything interacts with each other based on the, basically the vector between them. So, and the, the sort of interesting thing is that we also have this, this torque term, the angle, and the forces that they exert on each other might depend on, on the angle as well. So uh, things depend on distances and also relative angles is, is basically what I'm saying here. And we have pairwise interaction. Chris, what happened to those long fingers? Yeah, so this is a great, so this is a, a modeling question. So what we're saying in this is that we could model the fingers, but we're sort of thinking, well, there's a lot of them and it's kind of hard to know exactly what they're doing. So we're thinking about sort of average forces that they would exert. And that's what we're saying here is that we're, we're washing those out and we're just saying, whatever they're doing, they exert some average effective force. And that's what we're gonna call the force. And so we're, we're not gonna include the individual fingers. We're just gonna say, whatever they're doing can be baked into this effective force. And that, that's what we're thinking of. So the fingers touching the DNA, that would be the term chrome CS, because it's from the pole to the DNA. That would be, so whatever it's doing to the DNA, we're gonna try and lump that into the interaction between the pole and the DNA. Does that, does that seem okay? Yes, yeah, so, so what about those, those spindles? Do, uh, do, do th how do they interact with each other? Yeah, so, so yeah. let me tell you more about maybe the, the details of each of these terms. So I'm just sort of okay. telling you the structure of it right now, but yeah, I'll, I'll go through each of the terms. So, um, so everything interacts pairwise. The first one is, is sort of simplest. So, and I, I guess I should say that this is a little bit guesswork. We're, we're kind of thinking like, what could the forces be? So. Uh, the DNA are really big and they have these orientations. So the, the first sort of pairs you could imagine are DNA-DNA pairs. So when they're in close proximity, they're so big that we imagine that they just sort of repel each other with some steric repulsion. And what that looks like is basically uh, with some length scale that decays, so that's what the exponential term is, they exert some effective force that basically pushes each other apart and the direction is, is just in the vector between them. But also these things have orientation. So the torque term here is basically, you could imagine if one of these was sort of angled and bumped into the other, they would kind of turn in a way that causes them to align. And again, this is just us thinking about what happens when you slam two, things, two of these things together. And we thought, well, if they're at different angles, they would probably turn to try and become the same angle. So that's what the second torque term is saying is it basically tries to make the difference in the angle zero and it tries to also push them apart a little bit. 
And, and this occurs at some length scale that we're controlling by LC. And we're saying that's why it's local is that we can make LC really tiny and this only occurs sort of really, really close by. So this is one type of interaction. The other type of interaction is the poles themselves could interact. And this, this we think of as from the molecular motors, but we're not including the molecular motors directly. We're not including the fingers directly, but what we can say is that there's some sort of effective force between these two things. And that again, we're not sure if they pull each other together. We're not sure if they push each other apart, but we're, we're going to say that that's controlled by some parameter that I'll call FS. That basically there's some force the two poles are doing to each other. And maybe they pull each other together, maybe they push each other apart, and we're gonna leave that to be decided later. But either way, there's some just force exerted between the, the poles themselves. All right. So I hope this, this sort of clarifies the flavor of the interactions a bit. The most complicated ones are, what do the poles do to the DNA? And I, I mean, in some sense, this is the most important because it's the DNA that's being moved around. And what we thought is, okay, well, if you have these fingers coming out of the poles and the DNA is at some angle, then if the fingers are kind of pushing against the DNA, then that should cause some rotation, some torque. And the only way that you wouldn't get rotation is if the microtubule finger is exactly orthogonal to the DNA. And basically that's what the torque term is, is it basically says that it wants to rotate these things such that the angle between the DNA and the and the pull and the finger exerting the force is, is zero. And then, okay, so what about the sort of linear force? Does it push or pull? And this is actually kind of measured from biology. And basically what the idea is that if the DNA is too close to the fingers, the fingers push them away. So what that what that translates to is short range repulsion. So if the DNA is really close, the fingers bump into it and push it away. But if it's really far away, then the molecular motors exert their forces and kind of pull it back. So this is actually a, a thing that people use pretty commonly in this, this realm is short range repulsion, long range attraction. And that's, that's kind of the linear force term, the kind of uh, position term. And, and there's this really weird term that, uh, <laughs> yeah. So the other sort of weird thing is that, okay, when the finger attaches to the DNA and it tries to rotate, if you think about the finger being a fixed length, and then this thing trying to rotate, because the, the action arm is of fixed length, it actually causes linear motion in an arc around that radius. And that's that, this last term. So this is kind of an interesting thing that if you include torques and you think about interactions being sort of at a fixed length, which is again, a modeling assumption we made, then you get sort of linear motion from, from torques. But, Ultimately, what, what you need to know is, is basically that the poles sort of push and pull on the DNA depending on their distance away. And this is really a measured thing. And we're, we're not totally making this up, although the details are, are kind of fuzzy about like why this might be. And yeah, so does this, does this make sense with everyone? I, I think this is by far the weirdest, but if you believe this, then it's okay. All right, so what, what happens when you put all this stuff together? So here, I mean, this is the, the cool part, I think. Put all this together. Here's two kind of slightly different initial conditions with very slightly different numerical parameters. And what am I doing? So I'm putting a bunch of DNA down randomly, and then I'm putting a bunch of poles down randomly as well. And I ask, okay, well, what happens when you simulate this model? Uh, did it play? Oh, there we go. Okay, so here's two different simulations in the model. And what do you get? Okay. So in the top left one, you get exactly a bipolar spindle. So let me see if I can go back. You started with a whole bunch. So this is the cancer cell simulation. You start with a whole bunch of these centrosomes and then they naturally clump together. And if I just showed you the end of this movie, you would say, oh, that's a perfectly good mitotic spindle. So this is exactly what the cancer cells are doing is they're taking all of their extras and clumping them together and kind of feigning the, the classic healthy spindle. But of course, we could change parameters and say, well, the cancer cells don't always do that, right? Like sometimes they have multiple asters and we can also get that. So in this movie, you, you start with a pretty qualitatively similar initial condition. And you see that here you get the, the three pole case as you do it in the biological observation. So, so I, I, Chris, I, hey. so, uh, if I may just ask a question, how do you yeah. came with these initial conditions? Like you, you think about, you thought about it or... 
Um, it's just random not, and you not, found... Not terribly hard. Yeah, yeah. So I would say that the main thing to know about the initial condition uh, is that the, the poles are on the outside. That, that, that is sort of a, a, a critical thing, is if I start with the poles on the inside, then if they clump together, they all just clump together. So that this is a thing that we, we sort of are not sure of, but we said, okay, well, what if you imagine the dots start on the outside and then the DNA starts on the inside? And beyond that, we just sort of randomly picked based on that. We, we're not sort of deliberately deciding exactly where on the inside. We just say, splat the DNA down randomly on the inside of some disk and put the poles on the outside of the disk. And that, that was the only thought that we put into it. But yeah, that, that's a really good question. How do we decide these? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, so what, what, are, what are the reasons that uh, they tend to come together instead of having like all six of them evenly distributed around in a circle or something like that? Yeah, yeah. So, so this is a good question. Like what, what, what can the model do? So what we did is we basically, um, I, I hope this sort of addresses your question. We, we change parameters a little bit. I mean, this is basically what, it, what addresses your question. Parameters control what they do. And what I'm, I'm showing here is kind of like a phase diagram of, um, what the model does as you change two of the parameters. And what I'm doing is just Monte Carlo simulations, like you just saw in the previous video, just a, simula a forward simulation of our model. And then with random initial conditions, on average, how many sort of clusters of dots does it end up with? So what you see is that, okay, the model can actually do all sorts of things here. So in the top right is exactly the scenario you were just asking about, like the poles basically are kind of evenly spaced. But then we can kind of get like this other weird triangle shape. But importantly, kind of the middle green region is the classic bipolar spindle. But of course, the, the poles can also clump together. And it really seems like these two parameters somehow kind of control this. And I'll, I'll come back to maybe what these parameters mean. But it really seems like you can tune the model to end up with each of these equilibria, like it, it, if you wanted to design it that way. And of course, that. That sort of wraps back around into how do we interpret this biologically, but the punchline of this is that by tuning parameters, you can basically end up with each of these equilibria, these sort of distinct shapes of the, the spindle. Um, we were sort of satisfied with this, this phase diagram, but it's, it's just simulations and we, we were hoping to do some math. So I, I just wanted to maybe briefly mention that we did some math and it, it was inspired by this sequence of papers. So um, I think it, it dates back to uh, this, Andrea Bertozzi paper, and then uh, Theodora Kolkonikov more recently has these papers on predator-prey swarms. And even Steve Strogatz thinks about particles interacting with some orientation associated with them. So there's lots of people that think about if you put down a bunch of particles and the particles interact pairwise, and maybe the particles also have some sort of internal angle that dictates this. So that's what the sink and swarm oscillators paper is about, is they there's a bunch of particles interacting and they interact in some way pairwise. And they also have some angle that they keep track of. What, what is sort of the resulting behavior of this? And that's remarkably similar to our thing. But actually the most similar is this predator prey swarm thing where you can think about the DNA as like a swarm of prey and then the poles is kind of like predators. And there's some sort of effective interaction between the predator and the, the swarm of prey. And we saw this and we were like, wow, like maybe we can do a similar analysis to our model. And I, I'll just kind of maybe mention the, the key components of this. Uh, so the idea is, okay, I mean, maybe there were six poles, but imagine hypothetically, you take some mean field limit of this. So you say, imagine that I have a lot of these and I can smear them out and talk about a density rather than individual particles. And okay, so what do you get then when you get densities? Well. For the poles, the thing in green, you don't have to keep track of any angle. There's just positions. But the DNA, the, uh, the chromosomes, you do have to keep track of an angle. So there's, there's positions and also this angle theta. And I, I'm also including diffusion here, but I guess I didn't mention diffusion before. But ultimately what you get is you basically get a bunch of convolutions over space of like all the particle interactions. So I, I think this is probably a pretty common model type where you take a mean field limit of these, these particle interacting models. And I, I think a lot of you in dynamical systems have probably seen similar flavor stuff before. So basically what, what determines the velocity of say the poles? Well, the interaction with the poles themselves, you, you convolve over all spatial positions and the interaction with those spatial positions. And then the poles also move from the DNA and you convolve over all of the positions of the DNA. And that, that net effect is exactly what 
determines the total velocity. Um, yeah, and then there's also a torque term. So um, there's a little bit of a leap here. So we made up the forces anyway. So why don't we take qualitatively similar but simpler ones? So I took exponentials before, but you could imagine some like you could imagine short range repulsion and long range attraction that isn't exponential. That maybe it's like polynomial. And like qualitatively, that's the same thing. Like short range repulsion, long range attraction, you can write down a lot of weights. So this is kind of an annoying step that we realized like the thing we wrote down originally, there's actually sort of easier analytical forms of this stuff that is not quantitatively the same, but it was qualitatively the same. So it, we, we just kind of changed the interactions a little bit so we could do some analysis. And I just want to acknowledge that. Uh, but okay, what's the idea here? So the idea we got from these papers is that Basically, from our Monte Carlo simulations, we knew some equilibria. And we saw that there was a few different equilibria. We saw that there was an equilibria where all of the DNA is in the middle and the poles form a ring. And we also saw there was the, the sort of flip of that where the DNA is in the middle, or maybe I, oh no, yeah, I said that already. Uh, the poles are in the middle and the DNA forms a ring. And what this says then is, okay, well, that's an equilibrium that we think is an equilibrium of our model. Take that as an ensemble. And this is really the, the key idea of a lot of these papers that I cited is if you think that you know there's a ring solution, guess the ring solution. Basically say, I, I want there to be a ring solution. And what you do is you just plug in that ring solution to the PDEs and say, well, I want it to be an equilibrium. And what you can do is you can basically chase down the unknown radii of this. So note that I, I don't know what the, the radius of the ring is by any means. Uh, but if you sort of plug this in, I mean, mechanically, what is this? It's a balance of forces, right? For this ring to be a, an equilibrium, we need a balance of forces. So effectively what you're doing is you're saying, I think I have a ring solution to my mean field PDEs. I plug in the ring solution, and then I, I just need to make sure that it's an equilibrium. And, and sort of physically that says that I need forces to be balanced. And, and that's basically what you find. And you can chase down what R1 and R2 are for like an annulus of DNA or a ring of, so it's, it's, it's not that interesting to show, but I think the idea is nice. You basically say, if I think I know what some of the equilibria are, that I can basically verify that these are equilibria. And the idea that was really beautiful from these papers and the Kolkinikov one, uh, especially at the end, is you can actually do linear stability analysis of, say, these annuli solutions, um, the annular solutions. And the idea is basically like linear stability analysis, but you, you basically perturb the the radii and then say okay well like what what is stable in, in the linear stability sense so uh we weren't able to do this fully analytically and that's why i'm not making a big deal about it is we were able to push pretty far on this analytically but this linear stability analysis we could only do sort of numerically at the end so we end up with something that we like the the model we picked was a little too complicated to push this all the way through analytically but the idea i think is really beautiful from these papers and I, i'm super thankful that they exist because it gave us sort of a framework to think about how you would do linear stability analysis on our model. And I guess I should say, when you do that and you solve it numerically, basically what you find is, when do the two rings become unstable? And that basically gives you these two gray lines roughly. And that, that, that is exactly what we sort of expected from the Monte Carlo simulations anyway. So I, I think it's nice that we are able to do some math here, but it, we didn't learn too much from it, I guess I should say, is we, we kind of learned the same thing that we, we knew before from simulations is that you can make the two rings unstable and there's kind of a rough parameter combination that causes them to be unstable. Um, hey, but can, can oh, you yeah. remind us of what the two, the X and Y axis parameters are that cause this? Ah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I was gonna interpret this. Yeah, yeah. So this is a great question. So what, what are the X and Y axis here? So here's the one that I wanna hone in on is the X axis especially. So what this was, it was the interaction between the poles themselves. So remember, we thought that is basically because the fingers have these molecular motors on them. And actually, they, there's these papers in the cancer literature that say, well, if you disable the molecular motors, which presumably would be causing this force, FS. So FS is the magnitude of the force between the poles themselves. If you disable that, then you get more multipolar spindles. So what that would correspond to in our picture is, say you're a healthy, devious cancer cell somewhere in the middle of the green area and you, you, you formed a bipolar spindle but then you disable these motors 
So FS goes from being negative and functioning properly, causing them to pull together. And all of a sudden FS is turned off. So I, I, I'm thinking about that shooting to the right. So FS is turned off, it's no longer negative. Then you would get more multipolar spindles, which is I think what our model says is disable FS from going negative, which is doing its job to zero. And that goes from the green region to the red region. So it, they go from pulling each other together sort of normally, and that's essential for a healthy looking spindle to not pulling each other together. And that seems to promote multipolar spindle. So we're happy with this is we, we didn't build this into our model and it sort of agrees with this thing observed in the literature. The other thing that's sort of interesting is this Y axis thing that I, I was making a big deal about the torque and like all these weird interactions that cause the things to spin, but you can see that at least it, it sort of matters, right? Like if we went from the bottom left corner and the only parameter I change is the torque, then eventually I can get a healthy spindle just by making the torque larger. And I mean, this isn't a wildly compelling argument, but at least it says that causing the DNA to rotate at least can contribute to the resulting shape of the spindle. And that was kind of a sub point that we wanted to make is that no one really cares too much about these angles, but we were saying, okay, well, if you include these angles, you can have sort of a meaningful impact on the behavior of the model when you include these, these angles. So yeah, I, I mean, I, we, we're not really sure, like no one has measured torques in this scenario or anything like that, but we're, we're sort of hoping that people see this and say, okay, well, maybe we should start thinking about torques and things rotating in, in mitosis, because it's clear that if you bake this into the model, it can have a meaningful impact. Is this is this okay? Any questions? Okay. Um, so that, that maybe is the good news. The bad news is this. Um, so this is a, a figure from the paper and I, so it may be not easy to decipher what this figure is saying, but um, so in our, in our simulations, what we do is we start with an initial configuration and the model approaches an equilibrium. And at least numerically, what it seems like is for every set of parameters, there appears to be one stable equilibrium in our model. But in biology, they look at the same collection of, of cells and that same collection of cells, which you could think of as having the same parameters, maybe, um, has some percentage bipolar and some percentage multipolar. So, I, I mean, you could say, well, maybe the different cells have different parameters, but to me, like what would be more sort of reflective of the, the data would be that our model has multiple equilibria and depending on the initial configurations, you sort of end up in one of these potential wells, you could think about it, that like you, you start, you pick an in initial configuration and maybe bipolar and multipolar is both stable and you end up with some percentage of each of them for the same parameter set. To me, that would be like the ideal model, but I have no idea if it's even possible to get multi-stability out of these models. I, I was looking at like the Strogatz papers and I just sort of wanted to be transparent about stuff that I think I'm not sure how to do, but maybe some of you might. Um, I mean, Strogatz cares about stuff synchronizing, not, not so much multi-stability and maybe doing almost asynchronous stuff like splitting into groups. But I think a more authentic model or a model that would reflect the data better in this context would be one that has sort of multi-stability, that sometimes it's bipolar, sometimes it's, it's multipolar. And I, I'm not sure if multi-stability is, is possible in these models. Um, the other thing was we only know how to do the ring solution. And that's because the ring, all you have to know is the ring and a dot in the middle. But obviously our, our model can do other shapes, but I don't know how to do linear stability analysis on these because you have to guess the onsets. You have to guess the shapes up front. And especially if I go back to the bipolar one, you can kind of see it's, it's not so easy to guess the shape of the DNA in that. Like, and I don't know what shape it is. So I, I don't know how to take this as an onsets or I don't know how to prove that bipolar is an equilibrium of our model, I guess is what I'm saying is, of course, I can say, put the poles at two dots, but then what do you do with the DNA? It's, it's something in the middle, but like without knowing the shape of the thing in the middle, you can't really say this is an equilibrium. So I, I don't know how to verify that bipolar is an equilibrium of our model. And in some sense, it's the most important one because that's the classic thing. So I just wanted to maybe mention stuff that I don't know how to do, but if, if people have ideas on this, I would, I would love to hear them. Um, no. So, 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 so the, the, the chromosomes, when they get too close, they don't have any choice, right? They all have to kind of function as one. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So can that be an, an ansatz and look oh, at- Oh, okay. Yeah. Like kind of like, 
not quite homogenized, but say rather than have like this, just sort of smoosh them into one effective chromosome or something like that, and then see if you can push through the analysis that way. Yeah, that, okay, that's a good idea. I think I should try that. Um, oh, I think you might have remuted. Lysan, we cannot hear you. Oh, so, 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 but your simulation seems to show that the chromosomes do get close to each other. I didn't understand why they would necessarily do that. But if they do get close, then they, don't they become kind of like one pile with one yeah. orientation? Yeah, 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 exactly. But uh, I mean, if you think about this in the PDE sense, um, right. so that would be a constant density, but it's right. like a constant density in some right. like 2D region. And right, I right. guess the, the difficulty that I couldn't figure out is what is the shape of that 2D region? Uh, and that was the thing but, that I But it, it, these show, uh, I mean, am, am I right that things somehow, I, mean, I, did, I did not understand why, but somehow the, 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 the poles tend to group and then mm -hmm. the chromosomes tend to group. So in mm -hmm. the end, you have kind of um, the, the, chromos the chromosomes in particular act more like one or two or three rather than 46. Yeah. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. in which case it does- Could, could that like simplify pushing. the picture? Yeah, I think it, it could, yeah. And I mean, I guess I should say that maybe slightly annoying thing is that the, the DNA, the thing in the middle, they have this little stair propulsion. So they push each other apart a little bit. So that's why they don't just collapse onto sort of one thing, but you could turn that off. I mean, it's not really that important of a feature of the model. And I think if you turned off the, little bit of repulsion, then they would just collapse onto one thing. And then it's maybe an easier picture of you just have sort of one effective DNA thing and then the poles, and then you could ask, is that like a stable equilibrium and do like analysis of that? So I, I think that actually is a good avenue is, is say turn off the little bit of repulsion that the DNA has, and then there's sort of one effective object and, and see if it can be done. Yeah. I think it's a great idea. Is it easy to explain why um, the, uh, the, 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 the poles tend to form groups? Um, uh, yeah, so, so I, I think a little bit, right? So this parameter FS, if FS is negative, then they attract each other. So uh, like that, that's sort of the reason is that- Okay, so, FS, so once they get close enough, they will just collapse into one crop. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Thanks, yeah. And, and sort of the interesting thing about the bipolar spindle, and maybe I should have harped on this, is that FS is negative there. So the dots are pulling on each other. So like in the two sides, they're pulling on each other, but the DNA sandwich in the middle is sort of also causing them to like not collapse together. So it's sort of this delicate balance of like the dots on each side are pulling on each other. So that's how they form like the clusters, but the DNA being in the middle because they're sort of the equal and opposite force, they're pushing on those and the two sides don't collapse in. But yeah, if you make that force strong enough, so that's going to the left in the picture, the sides collapse in and you get the monopolar so that everything collapses in and they all just clump up together if you make their attraction strong enough. So yeah, that, that is why. Does that, yeah, it, does that clarify some of the intuition? I hope. Yeah, that just sounds so much like the stuff that we study in dynamical systems for like a couple of oscillators and a couple other things that are coupled together. But you have this extra DNA part, which is doing it that we don't have. So. It's very interesting. Yeah, yeah I would so, love to. So yeah, uh, um, relying on the question of Flaysang, uh, it should be great if you could just put for the moment your equations because sh she's making this analogy with this. And you have, a, at the beginning, you, you started, I, I forgot a little bit, you started with a couple of ODEs that are coupled. And yeah. with this, you're talking about this, all right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I guess, yeah, yeah. So I guess I am simulating the ODEs themselves, so position. So they're still discrete, yeah. But the, yeah. Yeah, so, so this is, is a this is a small network. You you you, yep. you have what exactly. uh, 10, 10? Yep, it, it is, yeah, you could think about this as a network. Yeah, there's just a bunch of stuff interacting sort of pairwise. Yeah. So it so, is just a network of stuff. Yeah. So in your simulations simulations, you have like what, like 10 Ys and and like 40 X's, yeah, yeah. So it's not even a big system, it's like, yeah. All right, all right, all right, so yeah. Yeah, so I think there is definitely an analogy there and I, I'd love to hear more about this because I don't I don't know like neuroscience stuff or even dynamical system stuff as well. So I, I sort of can only think in crude like physics 101 pictures or you push and pull on stuff and move stuff around. And that's, let's, let's try three poles, not 10 poles. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess three. Yeah, like much lower numbers. Uh, 
and then just maybe it may be useful at least for me just now can you put your pde just oh yeah, yeah 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 of course of course yeah 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 so here's the mean field version of them so you All get right. these these convolution terms in here All right. No, that was interesting. So, yeah. Uh, all right. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. yeah thank uh, you. Thank you. Yeah. So I don't think I have a ton of time. So let me just briefly mention the slides. Yeah. So maybe so, just a bit more than five minutes. And yeah. Perfect. All right. Yeah. Yeah. That that should be no problem. So, uh, I mentioned these biologists that we work with, and uh, so I said the last project. I think we're trying to match qualitative behavior. We're trying to get shapes out of our model. We're trying to get different equilibrium shapes, but. I think we're like fundamentally in the age of data where now we should think about modeling in really an honest quantitative sense. And I, I'm really fortunate to work with these biologists at the New York State Department of Health. And what they're able to do is they're able to actually track the DNA in a cell and the poles. So this is not a cancer cell, it's a perfectly healthy human cell. And what you see in the two gray dots are the two poles. And, um, the yellow dots are the attachment sites of the DNA, and that's actually what they're able to track. And I'm just drawing these lines for visual cues so you can kind of track what's going on. So what's going on at the beginning of this is the poles are sort of somewhere in the cell and the DNA is kind of scattered about. And then you can kind of see that like, okay, well, the poles move around and the DNA moves around and the DNA kind of does something relative to the poles, but it's pretty hard to tell what's going on with this data. I mean, this data, I could watch this movie all day and, and there's certainly something going on, but it's not like super easy to tell exactly what the DNA is doing relative to the poles because the poles are also moving. But I mean, this is a dream as far as modeling because now we have actual data of this stuff that we're trying to figure out what is moving like or what is causing it to move. So I, I guess like when we first got this data, we were like, what do we do with this? I mean people track stuff moving in cells all the time, but they often compute stuff like a diffusion coefficient or things like that. But we really care about the fact that these DNA are sort of in the same cell together. And I, I just wanted to acknowledge that people have thought about like what you do with data of stuff moving around together for a really long time. This Leah Keshet paper was actually about, I think ducks, like ducks in a swarm and like how ducks interact with each other. But it's still like a similar flavor question of if you track ducks moving around, how do you, tell their interactions. And uh, we recently found this, this Mauro Maggioni paper, which really tries to look at a statistical approach of this, basically saying, um, if you have trajectories of, of particles interacting, can you learn the interactions between them? And this problem is hard for our data, but what you can see in these kind of 2D projections is it looks like the, the DNA, so those are in the colors and it goes from cold to hot, it looks like the DNA follows the poles. So what we're gonna do is rather than try and learn everything, we're gonna think about the poles as kind of like external drivers, right? Like uh, we could just say those are some positions in the cells. We're not gonna try and predict what causes poles to move. We just wanna predict what causes DNA to move. Okay, that's, that's fine. And now we can just write down basically the exact same model. We say we have a bunch of positions of DNA and the DNA interacts with themselves pairwise, and they also interact with the poles pairwise. And I'm just kind of writing that generically. And here's the, the cool idea from the, the Maggioni paper, is you say, well, if you take forces of the form that I took before, where forces are sort of in the direction of the vector between the interactions, then the vector is R between the interactions, and then there's some scalar function, then what you can do is you could say, well, expand this unknown scalar function out in your favorite basis, like I picked Chebyshev. And then what you say is, okay, well, now I have a model that's linear in these coefficients that I don't know, um, but I want to learn. And I also have data and the data is known and the model is sort of known up to these unknown coefficients that are describing the interactions between the particles, but it's a linear problem, basically minimizing the squared error between the model and the data. So what you can do is just solve this easy linear problem and say, can I learn the forces directly from the data by just doing a, a least squares fit between basically the, the interactions and the model. And you can come up with all sorts of models here. And I'll just go through this quickly where I'll say, well, you can imagine they move to the spindle sender or maybe they interact with each of the poles. And what you can get is you can learn the forces. Like this is, this is great because now we can say, here's the data. We don't have to make up the functional forms that we did in the first project. We can just learn them directly. And 
there's lots of weird stuff here. Like velocity increases with distance away. And if you think like the analogy to like celestial mechanics, if gravity worked like that, where gravity becomes stronger the farther away you are, that would be like really weird and bad. So it's, it's apparently the case in these cells where the, the DNA is more attracted to the poles farther away. And that's, that's super weird. And then you can also include interactions between the DNA themselves and then learn this model. But you get kind of weird stuff where the DNA interacts with long range dependence, which we know is not physical. So this framework that we found in this paper is nice, but it's, it's not super satisfying because even when you fit it and then try and do forward simulations, you see that like obviously the forward simulations don't quite look like the real data. So we're fitting it using this cool framework, but we're not super sure that this is like the best way. So um, sort of in summary, we, we think learning from the data is essential. And I think it's this really exciting avenue that I'm honestly more excited by the second project than the first, because I think this is the future where we have actual data. We don't have to make up functional forms and models. Like we can learn them directly from the data. But it's clear that this, this framework that we're starting with maybe has some shortcomings and we're thinking about using machine learning, but then how do you interpret it? Like we, we want interpretable learning as well, that we can go back to the biologist and say, here's what the data says. It's something interesting. It's something mechanistic, but kind of striking this balance of powerful, but interpretable is, is kind of hard. Um, and then say I wrote down all those models and we fit those models. How do I say which model is the best model for the data? Um, I'm still not sure of this. And, and maybe to just acknowledge a, a last thing that I'm thinking about, a question that haunts me is the biologist asks, uh, are any of these trajectories different from one another? So we're just given spatial trajectories and you want to know, are some of them fundamentally different? And I, I've thought about this problem for like a year now and I have some progress towards it, but it, it turns out like it's a surprisingly difficult problem to just take stochastic trajectories and ask like, is the, the process that generates these fun, like different processes. And it, yeah, I, I think I have some progress and I'm, I'm happy to tell people privately about this. And yeah, it, it, it's a hard question and I will, would love to hear other ideas. So uh, in summary, I, I hope that I've convinced you that mitosis is this uh, rich intersection where when you have data, you can really do all sorts of modeling and there's these really interesting mathematical questions, but also biological insight, which is something I definitely care about. And I, I think this, this is like a really fruitful area that I, I'm definitely gonna keep thinking about. And I would love to hear ideas on any of the problems that I mentioned and maybe work with people on them. So um, thank you. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks again. Thank you, Chris. Uh, do we have uh, questions? Maybe we have time for a couple. I always do, but maybe other people should have the chance. <laughs> Maybe okay, then I'm going to ask. Right? Okay, okay. So, so what, what do you, uh, the 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 structures that you told us about? Does it also interact with something outside of the uh, outside forces? And how? Yeah. I mean, is, yeah. is that driving the action of the poles more than the? It the, is. The yeah. So that's an incredible question. Yeah, I would say the poles themselves. I mean, yes, the poles interact with each other, but also mm -hmm. they, like, the fingers also touch the the edge of the cell, and they kind of like push on the edge of the cell and that kind of like spatially orients everything as well. So you're absolutely right that we have not like included an external force at all, but we kind of thought about this as like a little bit of a rabbit hole because as soon as you say, yeah, there's external forces, especially when you're doing kind of this like model fitting, it, it feels like the model fitting would just sort of push everything to the external black box and say, that's mm -hmm. what explains it. So we, we deliberately kept out ex external forces in hopes that we could sort of explain everything internally. But you're right that like in the honest biology, like the, the cell itself is kind of like pushing on all of these objects and really dictating their behavior as well. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, from, from the, the, the simulations to the, the data that you showed, it kind mm -hmm. of looked a little bit like the, like the can one de de the, the last simulations that you showed, it kind of looked like the, it, it looked like what could, de could one decompose the problem into two, like namely when the, those two poles, how they move, okay, and mm -hmm. how the rest of it is moving relative to those two poles, like. Exactly, you know, yep, yep. Is that, uh, is that a right, reasonable way to go about it? Yeah, and, and uh, I would say what we're trying to do is the exact second thing you said. So we're saying, think about the poles just sort of doing their thing. Now we want to understand how is everything moving relative to those? Like, 
think about those as like an external source to your dynamical system. How is like stuff responding to this external source, which is the position of the poles, those dark black lines. And that, that's what we're trying to predict and clearly doing not such a good job in this so far, but that's the dream is try and predict that. And then you could decompose it and come back to the harder problem, yeah. I have just a general question. Mm -hmm. Because you're, you're talking about these forces, which is which seems quite natural to, to obtain this kind of pictures. So mm -hmm. where does it come from? Did you come with that? Did biologists say that? And um, is there is a measurement of that or? Yeah, so, so there are a lot of like beautiful measurements of forces in this, but All I would right. say a lot of it is just us saying, stuff is moving so there has to be forces but there are an increasing number of like beautiful measurements that there are like forces at each of these positions that we're saying but it, i would say it's 50 50 guesswork and like uh like inspired it's, by measurements but it's in general hard to measure this stuff because it's so tiny and when you measure it you screw up the cell so you you, you don't want to interrupt the process because you want to watch it and yeah so it, it's kind of hard to get measured but uh like the, the physics, do we know? Or I, I don't know this, this field, right? No, so, so uh, I would say no. And, and there's yeah. lots of different philosophies here. So if you see like a Mike Shelley talk, there, there's other approaches where people include all of the, phys like all of the very basic physics, like, like molecular detail, include every single thing, molecular detail you possibly can. And yeah, there's different so schools of thought. Ours is simplify everything to sort of effective yeah, no. physics but you could also think about uh, the opposite approach which is we don't know what the physics are so just include everything and, and figure out like what matters yeah so we're at two ends of the spectrum of that yeah. and biologists we, you are collaborating with they mm -hmm. they they say what they they have the same approach of you or yeah i mean uh, they, they're good at taking images so they can right, track okay. stuff <laughs> They, but okay. they can't measure, they, they, okay. yeah, they can take images and track stuff. That's, that's their, thank their you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> but this, this process of uh, that, that, that the, the DNA starts to kind of clump together to form something is, mm -hmm. so it, before that, at the beginning, they were kind of floating all over. Is that mm -hmm. when the cell starts to want to divide that this process begins that you're. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Before and, and, that, yeah, they're and, just floating all over. Yeah. And, and actually, I you can tell this in a cell. So apparently there's a nuclear envelope. So there's kind of an envelope, like a, you can kind of think of it like an egg sac that apparently breaks right when it wants to go. So it like opens the floodgate. So this is a rare scenario in biology where we actually know T equals zero. Like T equals zero is a defined okay. biological thing here. So it's, it's kind of nice that we don't have to guess when is T equals zero. We actually know like the cell has a T equals zero. In this, in this what case. trick is that? Uh, this I I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, this is a good question. I should know, but uh, it's it's up upstream of whatever whatever this is. 